What's up guys, Jared here. It's been two months since Morbius' initial release, and not only are the memes still going, but inexplicably and against all odds, they are still dank. So dank, in fact, that as I live and breathe, Morbius is back in theaters. You maniac! How much longer can this stay funny? I mean, where is the roof on this thing? I think pretty near since Jared Leto is now in on the joke, and I suspect that comedy dies quicker when the butt of the joke crashes the party. So before the meme hits critical morb and implodes in on itself, join me for one last hurrah as I half seriously devise a theoretical framework to understand the meme that has made me laugh more than the last 20 years of Saturday Night Live combined. Part movie review, part meme analysis, this video will be an attempt to map the cultural forces that cosmically aligned to turn this underwhelming superhero flick into one of the year's comedic high points. The first pillar of Morb studies is what I'm calling the omitted adjective redundancy principle. This refers to when a social media comment utilizes a sentence structure that normally communicates a qualitative judgment, but takes out the adjective, depriving it of any evaluation whatsoever. Examples include this gem from user Justin Y, deeming Morbius one of the most movies of all time, or Blastabolt realizing that Morbius is definitely a movie, or Undercooked Baby Pig saying, definitely the movie, actors, plot, and overall a script. In Justin's case, with the adjective omitted, the superlative most awkwardly applies to the noun, suggesting a spectrum to the concept of existence which is commonly understood as binary. You either exist or you don't, and you can't really exaggerate something's existence. It doesn't really make sense to measure the degree to which something is or isn't a movie. So what might seem like a meaningless typo to the chronically offline creates a unique in-joke, that the movie's shortcomings are so basic, so tedious, so depressingly obvious that it barely even qualifies as a movie. And so while exaggerating the declaration that Morbius is a movie should feel redundant, it doesn't, it comes off as sarcastic praise. There are certain things that most every competent narrative movie includes. Things like a protagonist with an arc, or a meaningful inner transformation Morbius has no such thing. The only transformation Morbius undergoes is when he physically morbs into a vampire, and with this occurring around the 30 minute mark, the movie could have really ended at any time after that and it wouldn't have changed the film's emotional impact. But other than that, he learns nothing about himself, about his orientation towards the world, his relationships, nothing. Another element that movies often include, especially ones of the superhero variety, is a villain with a motivation. Milo's only discernible reason to be evil is because he can now, and because kids used to be mean to him. And even that requires an interpretive leap. His actions don't interface with Morbius' journey in any meaningful way. Milo doesn't challenge Morbius' moral code, like Killmonger does to Black Panther or the Riddler does to Batman. Morbius just stops him from being a dick, flies into the night, and the movie ends. It's bad for the most banal film school 101 reasons imaginable, and that's why calling Morbius a movie in the style that we often give praise is hilarious. This celebration of Morbius's exceptional aptitude in the realm of existing leads to the second pillar of Morb studies, what I'm calling the Merit and Accomplishment Inflation Principle, which refers to internet memers engaging in a competition to see how egregiously they can exaggerate the movie's financial and artistic success. With a product that exists as extraordinarily as Morbius does, it's only right that its box office gross would be multiple times larger than the global GDP, or that it would dominate the remainder of the MCU's slate titles despite not even being a Disney Marvel film, or that it would redefine our understanding of basic human needs. On YouTube, passionate morb heads compete to see who can shower the film with the most poetic praise, to see who can weave together the kind of idyllic prose usually reserved for religious texts and literary masterworks and employ it to describe Morbius's profound impact on their lives. Now, of course, there's an implicit understanding that this effort is strictly academic for doing justice to the significance of Morbius is not something that can be done within the limits of language. And again, this exaggeration resonates for a movie that is so uniquely catastrophic that it's both so bad that it can't even be consistent in the reasons that it's bad, and so bad because it's 
tragically consistent with its dumbest errors. For example, consider Martine, the good doctor's love interest. One widely panned element occurs during the titular morbing scene, in which the movie signals to the audience that the bad guys are bad by their dated attitude towards women in the workplace. I can be wherever I want, nurse. It's a doctor. Actually. Now, lazy writing and pandering to social positions at the expense of believable world building is nothing new for Hollywood, but this movie can't even get that right. For the first hour of the movie, the evidence that Morb and Martine are romantically interested in each other is vague at best. Yeah, Milo asks Michael about her, but Michael's response is entirely about her performance at her job. There's no chemistry between Morb and Martine, no flirting, no history, no scenes of palpable unfulfilled longing. Just her being concerned when he's definitely going to die, happy when he's maybe not going to die, and Morbius puts a blanket on her after she gets knocked out. I'm pretty sure that all of these things fall under the umbrella of things co-workers can be expected to do without assuming any romantic insinuations. I mean, since when has caring whether your colleague drops dead been considered flirty? It feels like the movie expects us to assume that Martine is the object of Morbius's romantic ambitions only by virtue of her being hot. It's really the only thing we've got to go on before they spontaneously start making out an hour and 15 minutes into the movie. So on the one hand, characters are deemed evil for judging a woman based on her appearance and status at the workplace, but on the other hand, a basic element of the plot only works if the audience does exactly that. So which is it, movie? Can you at least be consistent in your badness? Also, what the hell is up with these kids at the beginning? We're meant to believe they're laughing at Morbius and Milo because they're disabled, but what's the joke? What could possibly be so funny about kids laying on a bed in the window? Does the filmmaker assume that the audience is so morally pure that we could never imagine why someone would make fun of the less fortunate so we just have to accept it at face value? I mean, when we look at Thurman Merman in Bad Santa, at least we understand what kids might find funny about bullying him. But seriously, what could be so damn funny about kids laying on a bed in the window? It would be one thing if this was just an oversight, just the inevitable consequence of having to get through the first act of an action flick as quickly as possible. But no, it actually seems to be the point. As if doubling down on bad decisions, the writer mirrors the kid's baseless cruelty with Milo's spontaneous evil post-morb. Both the kids and Milo are dicks for no apparent reason. Almost as if there's some kind of profound point being made, that arbitrary cruelty just breeds more arbitrary cruelty. But movies usually benefit from things not being arbitrary, from connective tissue animating characters' decisions and the audience being able to identify with those decisions. So sure, it's competent in that it's a consistent message in the movie, but it's not one that helps the movie, kind of like if I tried to make a movie in which the point was that an uneventful childhood leads to an uneventful adulthood. I mean, sure, it's a point, but is it a point that is conducive to an interesting movie? Anyway, I digress. The third pillar of Morb Studies I'm calling the Jared Leto Self-Importance Discrepancy Principle. This refers to the disparity between the lofty art house qualities of the Jared Leto brand and the mundaneity of Morbius's flaws. Jared Leto is a lot of things. He's an Academy Award winner. He's a rock star. He's a notoriously annoying method actor who still underwhelms when portraying the most iconic comic villain of all time. I've also heard conflicting reports that he might be a cult leader. He gave an incredibly brave and compelling performance as a trans woman in the early 2010s, he ascended to Hollywood stardom through the 90s indie scene, and has carried that avant-garde quality with him. Whatever words you want to use to describe the Jared Leto brand, safe isn't one of them. You know the saying that the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Well, I think that also applies to aspirations. When we see Leto's rebel esteem attempt to lend a sense of grandeur to a movie that barely even qualifies as a movie, it makes undercutting that prestige all the more potent. It's kind of like the Kanye fish sticks joke. It's all the more hilarious because we know that Kanye takes himself very seriously. Combine that with the reports of Jared Leto's method acting, slowing down production so he could travel to the bathroom in crutches, it becomes amusing to see a self fashion symbol of artistic elevation reduced to a Power Rangers meme. The final pillar of Morb studies is what I'm calling the the word Morb sounds fucking stupid principle. Now, I don't know if Morbius creator His Holiness Roy Thomas ever identified a direct inspiration for the name Morbius, so I'm just going to assume that he was inspired by Greek names like the ones in Ovid's Metamorphoses, like Orpheus, Morpheus, 
Pyramus, hermaphroditus, etc. The Greek suffix eus is appended to a noun to give it a masculine connotation. Essentially, it becomes a man's name who is associated with or defined by that noun. So if we were to take Ovid's god of dreams, Morpheus, the first part, morph, comes from the Greek morphe, which means forms, shapes, figures, or more holy, artifice. Therefore, the name Morpheus roughly means the man concerned with structure and artifice, which is fitting for the god of dreams. Extending this logic to Morbius, we would conclude that Morbius means the man characterized by morbidity of death, disease, darkness, that which is disturbing or unpleasant. Now, this adds to the humor of the meme in a couple of ways. Uh, one, the etymology suggests that the character is defined by bleakness, so there's a pretty stark contrast being made when comparing it to the flippancy of something like Power Rangers. Two, if you take the suffix away from Morpheus, you still have morph, which in English, at least, is still a word. But if you do the same for Morbius, you're left with morb, a meaningless word that sounds really silly and even sillier knowing that morbidity is basically the opposite of silliness. But since Morbius morphs more than Morpheus ever did, it was inevitable that some internet hero, some prophet of the airwaves, would deem it sensible to replace the word morph in familiar cultural settings with the stupid-sounding morb. And three, Morbius the name associates the character with profound aspirations. It recalls the forefathers of literature, figures who formed the building blocks of history, storytelling, and mythology. Whereas Morbius the movie barely even qualifies as a movie, so it epically fails in doing justice to this association. And I think that's all the Morbin that my brain will allow for now. So concludes my contribution to the budding discipline of meme studies. My best guesses as to why Morbin time has dominated the internet. If you want to check in on the mental health of a man who spent his entire Saturday analyzing Morbin time memes, hit up my Twitch stream. I'm currently playing Disco Elysium, which some have told me is the most philosophical game ever made. You can catch me Wednesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Also want to shout out to all the Morb heads in my Discord for sending me their favorite Morbius memes. Links are in the description for the Twitch and the Discord server. So join the community and as always, catch you next time. Peace.